and you now have not only relationships, but you also have responsibilities. In our work, we have put a lot of focus in our field on getting people out into the community. Remember all those times we used to write down where someone went or how often they went just to go out? And then we started moving towards building relationships while people were out and about. What we really need to look at much more closely and focus on is taking on responsibilities and being contributors. So let's hear about Lenny and Kate and how, how, how they have moved on to the next level. So here's our picture of Lenny. Um, I talked early, uh, introduced him to you early on. He lives with Mrs. Hayes, as I mentioned. Mrs. Hayes' home happens to be located across the street from a park in their hometown. That park has a lake which the local college rowing team uses to practice. Miss Hayes and her staff and the staff, Michael, notice that Lenny often watches the rowing practice from the window. Um, they ask, noticing this, if he would like to try rowing. Um, they don't. They get a less than enthusiastic response from him. He seems a little bit hesitant, but they don't. Michael, the support staff, is a pretty persistent guy, and he doesn't give up. He asks Lenny then, would you like to just go to the park and watch the rowing practice from close, uh, close up? And Lenny does then perk up and appear a little bit interested. So they begin regular visits to the park during rowing practice and have um, Michael and Lenny have many conversations over the next several weeks and multiple visits. Eventually what Mike learns is that Lenny doesn't really want to row. In fact, he's not a very strong swimmer and, and not a huge fan of participating in water sports. But he does enjoy watching the rowers. He likes being outside, and he likes feeding the ducks that come over to the shore while the rowers are out stirring up the middle of the lake. So over the course of the next several months, one of the rowing team members begins staying after practice and feeding the ducks with Larry, with Lenny. Excuse me. So one day, as they've gotten into this routine of visiting the lake and feeding the ducks, Michael brings along some schoolwork. He's a college student, as so many direct support professionals are, and offers Lenny a pencil and a piece of paper while he does his own work. Lenny proceeds to draw a very nice rendition of the entire scene, complete with rowers and ducks and trees and lakes. So the very next week, Lenny and Michael go to a hobby store, and Lenny picks out a sketch pad and a set of colored pencils. Soon, Lenny is producing beautiful landscapes with signature purple ducks of all things. Another student from the rowing team, noticing Lenny's art, invites him to attend a continuing education art class at the community college with him. So we'll leave off there, and we have a few little questions now that we'd like to ask, see what you think about Lenny's story so far, and how he's beginning to develop some roles. Okay, so we're looking at which roles are informal, if everybody can see the quick poll, and you can mark off your responses. Um, looking at what roles are informal, whether they would include feeding the ducks, growing fan artist, student, or neighbor. So we'll give you a little while to mark off your responses and send them in. And then we can see what the group thinks as a whole. Everybody got that done? Okay, so let's see what the results of the quick poll were. All righty. Hazing in and out. There we go. All right. So 90% of you felt that feeding the ducks was um, an informal row. 
role and rowing 80%, 30% said an artist, nobody felt student, and 50% felt um, neighbors with an informal role. We have another question. I'm sorry, guys. It's just, just technology is a little slower than it was before. OK. So how did Michael learn about Lenny's preferences? Okay. Was it through observing, listening, trial and error, offering new experiences, or all of the above? Remember how Michael found out what Lenny was interested in? So which one of these? apply, or which two, or which three, or four. Some of you may think all of them do. So let's see how closely we're listening to the story and what kind of skills Michael had to really figure out what Lenny might be interested in. I'll give you a little time. OK. So we got the results back for the group. 14% um, said observing. And seven said listening, trial and error, and offering new experiences. So it seemed like observing was the highest um, area that you felt that Michael was used to really learn about Lenny's preferences, looking at observing versus even maybe asking questions, but just being a real good observer and seeing what interest Lenny had. Okay. So there's several, several key points after this poll that help us um, begin to think about social roles. One is um, that there, there are roles that Lenny's fulfilling or beginning to fulfill that are both formal and informal. There's a variety of roles. And if we think about our own lives, um, we certainly have both formal and informal roles that we fulfill. People who do fill a variety of social roles are more likely to be treated as valued members of the larger community. Um, the other thing goes to F's point earlier, that we are looking beyond the, just the mere presence of people in the community. It's not just about being, being there, being out in the community. It's about what are the responsibilities, what are you recognized for. So, so far in Lenny's story, he has roles that have developed really very organically, kind of a very natural flow to the process. It is the contribution of a very attentive support staff, but it almost feels like a series of happy accidents. Um, the truth is, for many people, um, the construction of social roles, just like a good solid construction with a set of Legos, really requires some very thoughtful and specific planning. And we want to talk a little bit about how do you plan or why plan for social roles now. I want to read a description of the document that's pictured here. Um, this was something I received over the internet. Um, and it, is, it was something that really resonated with me. The description of this article is sometimes pretty harsh. Um, but it gets at that question of why do we plan. And maybe it will resonate with you as it did with me. So here is um, what was written about this particular article. What would it take for people with developmental disabilities to become valued, socially included, and empowered within today's society? Not an easy question. Of course, in looking at such issues, we need to start with the old adage, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. After all, who would want to make the same mistakes again? And yet, day after day, year after year, we ask people with disabilities to put their lives on hold until we can get our own house in order or resolve the latest crisis. Whether it be funding shortfalls, recruitment challenges, or the latest demands of regulatory bodies, there always seems to be something that prevents us from getting down to the real work that motivated so many of us to enter the field in the first place. Such challenges are unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. We are therefore left with a choice. We can either continue wasting people's lives by asking them to place them on perpetual hold, or we can start placing people ahead of bureaucracy, investing funds where they matter most, and make the, 
biggest difference possible with the resources at hand. Funding dollars are drying up, pure and simple. As such, it's time to make some hard decisions about how the meager resources that we still command can best be put to use. With a myriad of needs to be filled, we simply can't address them all without spreading ourselves so thin that we become ineffective at virtually everything. Instead, it is time to commit everything we have to those areas and approaches that will make the most sweeping and positive difference in people's lives. You can find this document at the link listed above, but it makes a very important point, and that is um, we often say we don't have enough money to do the good work. And in fact, because resources are dwindling, it becomes even more important that we focus in that area. I want to give, want you to give a little more thought to what Beth just said and what she read and, and just think for yourself those things that really truly add value to your life. Yes, and it's the one, two, or three top um, things in your life that make your life worthwhile. And my guess would be that it would probably be people. Um, so I think with Beth's reading, we need to have the same focus as other resources and funding. For, um, getting smaller and smaller, we need to put our time and energy to making these connections and having people um, take on roles where those connections has. So let's talk a little bit about moving beyond identifying people's likes and interests and skills just to get them out to participate in activities, but really putting more concentrated effort in looking at those interests and skills in, a, in an effort to identify social roles that could be developed around them. Even though Michael was able to develop several social roles for Lenny, often it does take formal thinking and planning beyond just the observation. Um, and so we'll want to shift our thinking from activities, outings, programs, leisure, more to contributions, giving, responsibilities, volunteering, helping. So we challenge all of you to pull out a person's plan tomorrow or the next day. Kind of flip through it and look for these six words and how often they appear in the person's plan. Contribution, giving, responsibility, duty, volunteering, helping. Count how many times they are actually used in the context of the plan. If you cannot find any of these six words, we really have a ways to go. And you really need to look at developing a formal plan on getting the person Legoed. If you find three or four once or twice, you're on the right road. The thinking at least is there, and hopefully some actions also. Oh, if you so find cool. most of the six several times throughout the plan, send us your email address, and we can share your best practices with the rest of this group. No. For those of you who are on the call, there may be some who um, we're hearing each other, so if you push star six, that will help mute it in case you have other things that um, are going on right now. OK, so John O'Brien's website is a great resource. Check it out. There are several publications that speak to inclusion, um, which certainly focuses some on social roles, too. All right. So where do we go if informal efforts to support people to develop social roles haven't thought about the desired outcome? We need to look at the formal planning, which can start by asking the question, what are the person's desired outcomes, likes, and preferences? I saw this done in action for um, a woman I met a few months ago in the team, identified reading, children, dancing, being a jokester, and church under this list. Then they looked at what roles might match these interests. They got together and did some brainstorming on how can we take these talents and develop them into social roles. And they came up with a list, join the Literacy Council, collect used books for the library, donate books to the Children's Center, and read to preschoolers at Sunday school. Since 
reading to preschoolers to Sundays at Sunday school filled in several of her interests. That's the one they shot for. So then they looked at and asked the question, what skills will she need to take on this role? She had some good reading skills but needed to improve on reading, so they worked on that. And she also needed to look a little bit about the social etiquette for a preschool setting. So those are the two major skill areas that they worked with. Next, they asked what adaptation equipment might the person need to accomplish these roles. And actually, they came up with um, an equipment adaptation that I was not aware of. And it was a speaking machine for books. And you highlighted the words in the book and the machine fed out the word, and you could hear it. So this really assisted her in learning to feel real confident with the words of the children's uh, books. The next thing was, what does the who does the person need to know? And they decided that she probably need to know the minister and the director of Sunday school. They did a little social capital search and said, who knows who knows who? Who knows the minister? Who knows who knows who? Who knows the director of Sunday school? Got those connections and got permission for her to try out some readings in the preschool setting. And an area that maybe some of us wouldn't think about, but another question to ask is, are there certain attire, clothes, um, that outfit uh, that go along with the role. Um, I think we talked a little bit about choir board members before, and sometimes people need support in having the right kind of attire. Um, in this case, she, when she started doing the preschool meetings and really enjoyed it, she decided she wanted to invest a little more money in having some more Sunday tests. So this is a tool that you could use if you're going to move forward with some football planning. OK, so let's look at the difference between planned versus accidental. As we heard in Lenny's uh, story, Michael's support was informal. Um, is this the best or only way? No. So it will depend on the person. For some people, informal supports work great. For other people, you'll need to do formal planning um, if you're going to get people legoed. And sometimes that also has to do with the culture of the organization. Sometimes there are a lot of staff who just think in the area of connection social roles. Other times there are quieter, shyer staff, um, and they may need some more support in the expectation that formal planning needs to be done. So um, it should become a priority goal if informal planning aren't working. All right, so we just want to tell you about a few people that we've met around the country who have successfully um, taken on some social roles. We have Alfred here, who's with the Arc of Atlantic County in New Jersey. He's an artist, probably has some common interests with Lenny. And he sold his works and belongs to an art group. Several other people at the organization have also showed an interest in expressing themselves through art and have gone on to develop roles in this arena, exhibiting their work at fairs, auctions, and even designing um, baseball caps with artwork done on them, which they're selling on the boardwalk. I'm going to copy this website down and take a look at it. Make a Difference is a day. It's an encompassing annual national day of helping others. And this year, it's going to take place on October 24th. Ten honorees uh, are spotlighted and each receive a $10,000 prize, which is supported by the Paul Newman Own Foundation. Um, mark it on the calendar, get Legoed, and go for the go, the 10,000. So it's a great way to do a community type of um, support and community giving also. So we've discussed the importance of social roles and how to support people to develop social roles and the value of them. 
Let's now look at the differences and similarities between social roles and social capital. That question comes up a lot for us, and Beth is going to talk a little bit about that. Well, Ed has already given us a pretty good definition from multiple perspectives of both the word social and the, and the phrase social roles. So I just want to continue that discussion a little bit, focusing on our language, because language does influence our thinking. But more importantly, I think one of the, the issues that we often get caught up in is that we take language, everyday language, and assign different meanings to the word to words that the general population doesn't always have. And I think you know the word social. If we look at some of these synonyms, um, you know we can see communal, community, common, public, group, collective, shared. I think in our field, one of the you know if we just take one or two of these, the word group. Bring, calls to mind an entirely different image than it might in the general in the community at large. Even community is a word that has become more of a destination than a feeling or an atmosphere. And certainly, social we hear that um, as, uh, associated with social skills training all the time. And I think if we many of the people that we support would share some of those. Um, unique and idiosyncratic understandings of a particular word. If we do the same thing with role, synonyms from the dictionary include capacity, position, responsibility, duty, function. Oops, I went too quickly. Um, and if we think about that, um, and look, the word that jumps out immediately to me is one that we've kind of taken and made our own is that word of function. Well, certainly it means use, um, utility. In fact, we have taken it to, to and assigned it level, which I don't know that is actually um, a, a word that, in general, is assigned level. And finally, if we take do the same thing with the word capital, You'll notice that the synonyms of capital are all about resources, money, assets, um, very much associated with value. Um, whereas I'm not sure that in our, in our organizations we think of resources as anything but something that we don't have. Um, and it's a really important word um, to consider, especially in connection with social and social capital. So I want to talk a little bit about this concept and start with the disclaimer. Um, I know that a lot of people find the term to be rather complicated, maybe a little bit academic or pretentious, um, something that, that makes the, the idea of relationships a little, more, little less accessible than it should be. So we do use the term um, very purposefully, because it does make explicit something that we think is really important. Relationships, the networks with other people that we have in our lives, do add value to our lives in the same way as finances, information, and other forms of capital. And for people with limited access to those other forms of capital, people that receive services in our system, social capital and relationships become even more critical resource in their lives. So it's really embodied in this whole concept of pay it forward. We like this graphic here. But it's the, the approach of doing something without an expectation of getting something specifically back. This is not barter. But it is an expectation that on down the road, someone else will do something for you. It is about an atmosphere of connections between people and having social networks and norms of reciprocity and trust that go along with those networks. There are a couple of kinds of social capital if we want to dig just a little bit deeper. Um, if we think of Elmer's glue, this is really a concept you've probably, many of you have probably heard of it before, bonding social capital. These are the relationships and the connections that people have in their lives with other people that are similar to them, that have common interests. Um, another kind of social capital is bridging social capital. 
That's represented by the WD-40 here. And these are the networks with people that are different from us, that add diversity to our social circles. They're the ones that know things and people and places that we may not, that we learn from and that surprise us and add some excitement at times to our lives. Over the years at CQL, um, through a number of our encounters with people and organizations, we suspected that the people we support have very limited social capital. Usually they have a, a better, um, connect, better connection, better bonding social capital, if you will, but particularly bridging social capital seemed to be lacking. Um, and we became so interested in the concept that several years ago we wanted to look and see if there were indicators within our personal outcome measures that could help us get a better picture of this, that could give organizations a tool to benchmark um, their success at helping people build relationships um, in their lives. And so we did take a subset. As you can see, there are five indicators here, A through E, that are bonding social capital indicators about intimate relationships, having friends, being respected, family, and three indicators that get more at the bridging social capital, living in an integrated environment and interacting with other people and having social roles. So here's the connection of social roles to social capital that, as we see it. Social roles are one way that people build social capital. Um, and so we want to give you very quickly a demonstration of how you might use this subset of outcomes to measure. As Eph mentioned earlier, we do have a database of about 6,800 people. Um, and so we're able to take the data from that and come up with national averages. We can give you then this sheet, which will help you uh, measure your success. So for instance, in this, if you look at the far right-hand column, this is a hypothetical sample of 20 people. If you look at the far left-hand column, and each row and outcome, we have had a hypothetical determination that 10 people have, out of the 20 have that particular outcome present. And then it's just a simple division formula. And you, you can have a total of, you can do overall social capital or break it down by the bonding and bridging aspects of social capital. So in this hypothetical sample of 20, 50% had bonding social capital, 20% had bridging social capital for an overall average of 41%. The actual national averages are um, bonding social capital at 64%, bridging at 53 for an overall average of 60. So just Kind of in conclusion, these two little quotes may help us distinguish between and understand the similarities and connections of social capital and social roles. Yogi Berra says, if you don't come to go to somebody's funeral, they won't come to yours. It's that theme of reciprocity and social capital. Social roles, though, are really embodied in this State of the Union address from 1995, this quote. That, that talks about right, responsibility based on talents and determination and giving back to community and country. So I'd like to let Eph help you um, walk you through a little bit of our data specifically related to social roles. OK, Beth talked about some aggregate data for social capital, but let's look at pulling social roles out from that data and look at it individually. Um, this is the data for the last 10 years on the area of social roles. And as you can see, there really has been very little growth um, going just from 29 and 3 quarters percent in the outcome, just a little above 31 percent for people. Um, so very, very small. Um, in 1998, the support area, and what we were doing to support people to have social roles, was less than the actual outcome. So 
some people were having outcomes even though we may not have known what was important to them or we may not have been taking some actions or providing support, uh, support in that area. Now in 2008, um, at least the supports have gone above the outcome. So we have more supports in place and some people, a few more people are getting the outcome present, but hopefully there's been a growth in the support area at a much faster rate than the outcomes, providing hopefully some evidence that maybe we're a little more conscious about this, we're a little more aware of it, um, and we're trying to move in the direction of uh, focusing more on people developing social roles. Um, the data for 208 includes almost 7,000 people, and if you look at the percent of people who have that outcome present in their life, it's a point that they would like to. Remember, this is an area of I decide how much and how often and what. Um, only about 2,250 people out of the 7,000 have that uh, present. So that really isn't a very good outcome. We need to look at this much closely and hopefully five years down the road we can all come back and look at the data and see some really, really great gains. So really that brings us to kind of the, the million dollar question. Um, what is it that those organizations that are having more success with the support do differently from the rest of us. Given those numbers, what can we do to support more connectedness in the development of stronger social roles? As we said before, Michael seems to have a knack for it. You, we all have met those support staff that are really have the magic, the social connector magic. But what happens when they leave? If we can, we can probably all think back to a time where maybe it didn't happen right away. But the, the staff with, that were really adept at that, when they left, all of those relationships stay intact. I, oftentimes, my experience has been that they do fall by the wayside. So what are the ways that we can really make this work part of the organizational culture and embedded in the system? And how can we use that work and that attitude to influence our community? For just a really quick time here, one of the things that, that I'd like to present to you is our Quality Measures 2005 as one possibility for um, how we can do that. Um, our Quality Measures 2005, we, we've referenced over and over in this webinar the personal outcome measures. Hopefully many of you are familiar with them, and they are still at the core of everything that we do. But we also have um, a belief in the non-negotiable presence of basic assurances and a value base that supports person-directed services. And we look to the future of organizations that are responsive and connected in their communities. So I want to talk just a little bit about the themes in each of these measures and what they bring to the concept of social roles. Shared values of, are about organizational culture. They shape the expectations that we have for people and for our community that, that we're located in. And we should all, people supported, friends, organizations, and communities, have those high expectations for all people's ability to develop and fulfill social roles. Within the shared values measures, there are factors around dignity and worth are connected to contribution and people's rights to pursue the things that interest them around self-determination and choice and leadership. These are all things that connect themes of social roles and responsibilities to organizational culture and values. Additionally, in the basic assurances, while at first blush may not seem connected so much to social roles, but they form the bedrock of social stability. These are the systems that when we are able to individualize them in practice, really enable people to explore their interests and develop their roles in their day-to-day -day lives. 
again, there are themes woven in factors and measures around rights protection and dignity and respect, family members and natural support networks, how we train our staff in the culture of an organization and, and um, in the skills needed to make those connections, how we plan with people for long-term contribution and security. Responsive services themes really help think about um, redefining relationships between people, community, and organizations. These measures give you a format for doing a systems analysis that explore how organizations can structure themselves such that people experience fulfillment and achievement in the context of community. The indicators and measures under the person focus and the community focus in particular address these systems for that facilitate social roles. And finally, um, the newest measures are um, help are called the community life measures, and the themes within this are really about helping organizations redefine themselves, understand systems advocacy in a new way, and think of their place in the community as being an organization committed to community building. Organizations that are successful in this area necessarily value and facilitate the development of social roles and people being able to contribute and carry responsibilities in the community. So we're going to continue a little bit with the story around Lenny um, and introduce Katie in this story. At art class, Lenny meets Courtney. And Courtney um, is one of those friends of a friend of a friend that we talked that Eck referred to a little bit earlier. Um, she is friends with Dara's parents, and remember, Dara is Katie's support staff. So kind of one of those small world things, small community things. Courtney also owns a coffee shop in town where she regularly displays local artwork. And she invites Lenny to do a show at the shop. Of course, he's quite excited and prepares for that and um, immediately tells Katie and invites her as his date to the opening. Now, Katie, which partially explains, I think, the passion for Purple, is a huge Baltimore Ravens football fan. And even though it's nowhere near football season, Katie wears her Ravens jersey to the opening of his art show. Lenny also invites several members from the rowing team that he's been acquainted with over the last few months. Turns out, of course, that one of the rowers is so a big Baltimore Ravens fan. And on the spot, he invites Katie to join the fan club, the Ravens Roost, and gets her all excited and geared up for the um, tailgate parties that will be come, coming up during the fall. Now, Dara, Katie's support staff, has recently attended a training on effective planning practices. And it's fresh in her mind. And per her training, she recognizes these connections as opportunities for Katie. So Katie and Dara began to set up a series of meetings to plan for how do we build on these interests and develop some roles related to them. And being a member of a fan club is certainly a role. But over time, Katie volunteers to start maintaining the roster of the Ravens Roost and the mailing list for their newsletter from her computer at home. Katie does have a little bit of difficulty at speech, so, with, so her email correspondence with other Ravens fans is becomes even more important for her ability to connect and build relationships and fulfill her role. She has great support from Dara to maintain those connections and fulfill the responsibilities of being the Ravens Roost Secretary. The organization that supports Katie assists with the purchase of a new computer and the software that she needs to run the site, and they pay Dara's tuition so that Dara can attend the software classes with Katie at the local college. Dara and Michael finally are really recognized by their employer for successful planning efforts. Through the employer's newsletter and website, they have um, an award called the Bridge Builder Award, and they both are recognized in this way. 
So what are the lessons that we can learn from Michael and Dara? I think there are really three things that are really important. The first is that there's an organizational culture that it's okay to pursue things as they come up in real time. Michael and Dara don't have to ask permission, and they certainly don't think it's their responsibility to interfere with relationships that develop naturally. They understand that it's not their role to protect. The second thing is that there is a real possibility thinking that happens both in the systems and the culture of this organization. So Dara's received training. She has the resources she needs. She has her tuition paid. Michael and Dara both certainly have high expectations for the people that they support. They understand that it is possible for them to fulfill in meaningful ways these roles in the community. Finally, not only is it permissible, possible, it is really the way to do business. It's preferable. The staff are recognized and celebrated for their work. Katie and Michael are acknowledged for their contributions. It's openly celebrated throughout the organization. So now we're going to run another little poll with one or two questions. Um, so we're looking at favorite way to support Lenny's continued development as an artist. And here at the quick poll, looking at what you think was really motivating Lenny. Um, what are some of the main pieces to his motivation? Was it love of his subject matter, recognition of others, internal creative spark? So if you would go ahead and take a vote, see which one you think falls into the best category for motivating him, or maybe you think more than one. Um, so put your vote in, and we'll give you a few seconds, and then we will look at what the majority of you thought. Okay. People are still casting their vote. Okay. So um, recognition of others um, seems to be one of the lower ones, but all of the above um, at 94%. So most of you thought that all of the areas um, were things that motivated him, his internal creative spark, as well as his love of the object of painting and the recognition of others and opportunity to learn. And that's really a very um, common thing. It's it, the why of uh, why people get involved with specific responsibilities and activities can be varied and most often is a combination of both internal motivation, a passion that comes from something we just enjoy, as well as the recognition that we might receive from others. But it, cert it certainly doesn't have to be one or the other. I think we're going to have another question on the poll. See if they can get up. Okay, here we go. Um, how does Katie demonstrate her commitment to her role? So, what's she doing to demonstrate that she's really committed to her role? We have again five options to vote on. Um, whether you feel one or two are the major um, ways that she's demonstrating her commitment. Or the options are going to to Lenny's art attending with him. Um, when she gets to go to those tailgate parties, does she pay paper goods? Does she pay membership dues in the fan club? Is that enough to demonstrate a commitment? By in, um, is enrolling in the software class? Or all of the above? So I think we're finishing up the voting. Everybody's had an opportunity. It'll take us a second or two to get them tallied. OK, so here's our tally. Looks like, again, 86% um, think that all of the above are the 
ways that she's demonstrating her commitment. Seven felt going to Lenny's art show. Well, that may be it, wanting to be where Lenny is. And then seven felt enrolls in software class. Going to Lenny's art show is a really great example of um, Katie's role that may not be made so explicit. Um, she is a devoted girlfriend. And in fact, because of her passion for the Baltimore Ravens, may be the muse for Lenny's signature purple ducks. Those are both roles um, that she demonstrates commitment to by attending the art show with him. So the, and the other options are, are rather obvious. Um, paying dues are certainly something we often think about as a way to commit to a role, um, attending classes, and those kinds of things. So let's look at someone else now who um, you may have heard of before as someone who has really built over time some significant roles in his community. Some of you may have heard or even seen um, The Collector on Bedford Street, which is a documentary nominated for an Academy Award several years ago about director Alice Elliott's neighbor, Larry. And Larry's a community activist and a fundraiser. Um, when Larry's primary caregiver, his uncle, is no longer able to assist him, his New York City village in the village, in, in the village downtown, neighborhood community rallies together to try to protect his independent lifestyle. And what they did is they established an adult trust fund in his behalf so that he would have finances and support to be able to stay living in his apartment. Um, many of the neighbors contributed and had a meeting, and the fund started with $10,000. Uh, this is a wonderful resource. It's a great story of how Larry is so, so committed to his social roles in his neighborhood that he has built a huge amount of social capital through his social roles to the point where the neighborhood had New York law changed so that a group could develop a trust fund, and that was not on the books before. Um, you see the website. You can get a preview of this on YouTube, um, and you can get information. Um, it's, again, a good resource for training, better understanding social roles, looking at how a person continues to be committed and expands upon them. Um, eventually, he also has a girlfriend. He's a great dog lover, um, and um, again, a good resource that you might want to look at. We're going to talk about a few more resources here to try to give you some more tools to move forward. OK, and then we have Oprah's Random Acts of Kindness meets Flat Stanley. don't know if any of you have heard of the giving game, but it is a good way to start becoming a champion organization in supporting social roles. Um, you can go on this website, which we have listed, and become involved in a network of giving. And basically, there's a lot of fun activities people can participate in, getting a giving card and doing um, contributing to someone else. And then cards have numbers on them, and they can be traced, and at times, they traveled, a kind act has traveled around the world. So again, it's, it's a fun activity. We've seen numerous people use it, and they really enjoy it. So check out the website. OK, and then we have uh, World Kindness Day, which you uh, heard about, or make a difference, you heard about with the arc of Atlantic County. County. This is the World Kindness Day. This year it's taking place November 13th. And the World Kindness Week is November 9th through 15th. Again, a great kickoff or a great um, commitment now to become actively involved, get other community members involved, take a lead in this. So looking at how 
you can get everybody in the organization and other community members to participate. The website also is a great resource because it has a lot of free materials and uh, fun things. You can send free e-cards with and quotes like the one we're showing in a minute. And you can also get certificate of recognition for acts of kindness, um, kind of like what Beth talked about in the Bridge Builder Awards. This would be a good resource to be able to hook into things like that without a cost and get some more ideas. OK, and then we have um, Community Building Foundation. Don't know if, and I'm assuming some of you have read the Road Less Traveled, which was on the New York Times bestseller list longer than any other book. If you have, you know Scott Peck, who was the author of that. He's also the author of The Different Drum. Scott Peck was a very strong advocate for community building, and his website provides information about community building as well as some other resources and publications that you might find worthwhile. So now we um, want to just open it up for some conversation. I think you all have the, the question feature. You can type in some things. Um, but we thought it would be a good idea to share some of the ideas, things that either you've thought about today, that you've brainstormed in the past, that you're planning, things done in the past, and we thought we'd get you started with a few of our ideas that we've probably mentioned a little bit already or emphasized today, but this is just a beginning list. And I believe we were, uh, we sent you some resources about social capital and things, but we thought it would be fun if you could type it in your question box, any ideas that you might have, um, we'll share them with the rest of the group. Um, one of the one of the ideas we had was to organization kickoff on World Kindness Day and to invite other people from the community to participate um, in that activity. Certainly recognizing employees who've been successful in, in doing this work of building connections and helping people assume responsibilities and develop roles in, in their communities. Um, publicity piece, submitting story ideas to the local newspaper where people that do receive services have developed formal roles and are valued in their communities. And I, one of my favorites is, and I've seen that organizations that have done this quite successfully, is to have a social connector mentor program for staff where they can um, support each other and develop each other's ideas and skills and brainstorm around what are ways that we can do this with each person that we work with. What are some of your ideas? Anybody have any that have entered? And Susan, I am not able to view the question and answer mode. So if you are getting people typing in ideas, you'll need to share them with all of us. I'm not able to do that. <clears throat> At this point, we only have one question that we'll save for the end. Okay. Who yeah. wants to share their great ideas? I know you're doing stuff. Well, maybe they can put their thinking caps on and we can revisit it at the end. But this is basically the end, Susan. <laughs> We are at the question portion. So what is the question that you have? OK, will you repeat the six words left? To, will you repeat the six words to find in a plan? Sure. OK. Um, help, help us out with specifically what you're working. The area where we talked about you should look at a person's plan and if you can identify um, any of these I have words. them at okay. Um, it's contributions, giving, working, volunteering, helping. I think duty. Correct. You win. You got it. <laughs> 
Yeah, we'd love to hear from you if any of you um, do that. It would be wonderful if you would give us some feedback. That would be great. We'd really enjoy that because it's really taken quite a bit of time to think in these terms and then to see it actually in a person's plan versus they need, um, they need, they need to really look at these other aspects that are so important when it comes to social roles. Okay, we have a couple more questions coming in now that I see I need to scroll down. Um, will you make the slides available? Uh, I sent out yesterday a PDF of the PowerPoint. Uh, PowerPoint's too big to go through email, so that was one of the four handouts that were sent out yesterday. Um, here is an idea, I believe, of what they've, an idea they're going to do. Solicit for a sponsor, i.e., Adidas, ball players, etc. Excellent. Excellent. Right. So that you can then connect people that are interested in sports and that kind of thing through your sponsor. You have the the organizational social capital, if you will, to connect individual people based on their interest. And here's Excellent. another one: building relationships with community organizations, teaching each other. Yeah, yeah, that's such a huge piece of that whole community life measures is how do organizations establish themselves as a collaborator in the community and then um, address issues not from the special interest perspective but from the perspective of quality of life for all people in that community. That's excellent. You know, and some of those ideas would be great for make a difference. There's an application that needs to be done, et cetera. But just think, I mean, if it takes a little time and you could get the $10,000, there are 10 honorees on that. And I know last year um, there was an honoree that it was just two people to a group of 50 people who were involved in things. So, you know, to take a little extra time and look at what that might mean. What a great way if you were able to be an honoree to really show the um, importance and, and how it can benefit the whole community if you got involved in that make a difference. And we'd love to hear if you do, so make sure you let us know. I don't see any more coming in. Okay. Well, it's an important topic and one that we can talk about. Um, all of us can be talking about for years to come, I'm sure. So um, in your individual conversations, um, if, if other ideas come up and you'd like to share them, that would be great. Um, we want to thank you for taking the time this afternoon, for bearing with us and our technical difficulties as we um, had some connection issues and that kind of thing. If you would like to speak either with myself or F. O'Neill individually, I put, we put our contact information up here, email and cell phone numbers. It's also general information, um, contact for CQL and, as um, an organization. And again, just thank you so much for your time, for your contribution, and we wish you good fortune as you go out and connect people to their communities and help them really build those social roles. Have a great afternoon. Take care.